Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the Star Quest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by rosaryarmy.com have more peace visit rosaryarmy.com and get a free all twine knotted rosary downloadable audio rosaries and more make them pray them give them away at rosaryarmy.com you're listening to episode 152 of jimmy aiken's mysterious world where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're answering weird questions. I'm Dom Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Aiken. Hi, Jimmy. Howdy, Dom. Since this is a fifth Friday in April, we don't want to leave you without an episode this week, and so we bring you another episode of Weird Questions with Jimmy and Cy Kellett of Catholic Answers Live. Jimmy, what weird questions will you be answering this time? We're going to be answering a bunch of stuff, including questions about popes in space, sacraments on the International Space Station, why St. Christopher is sometimes depicted with a dog's head, time travel and future popes, baptizing baby Yoda, baptizing the Wicked Witch of the West, and giants in the Bible. Excellent. I can't wait to hear how you answer those questions. So let's get on with the show. Proprietor of Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World. Hi, Jimmy. Hey, how's it going, Cy? It's going very well. I have not been over to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World today. Did it drop? Did the radioactive Boy Scout drop? Oh, yeah. Already getting a lot of uh, nice feedback about it. Um, well, are you ready for some weird questions? Sure. Yeah, it's going to get very weird today. Uh, space questions, angel questions, every every odd kind of thing uh, today. Mm-hmm. We receive these weird questions via the the various uh, electronic media. Occasionally we might get one as a handwritten letter, but uh, generally email or Facebook and all that kind of stuff. And Jimmy uh, uh, kind of assembles them for us. Does Marie ever help you with that? Does she ever send any to you? She forwards emails to me or someone does, but then I keep a log of them. Uh, And then uh, when when we got enough, we come in here and we get to hear Jimmy's uh, question answers to these very strange questions. So there won't be calls this hour, but there'll be a lot of fun. Jimmy Frank asks via email, if humans had to leave Earth, which is actually kind of a typical beginning for a a weird questions with Jimmy Aiken uh, question. Yeah, that's not if humans had to leave Earth and live on spaceships or other planets, would the Pope still be the Bishop of Rome? Would the bishops get new dioceses? Well, it depends on the situation. Uh, If let's suppose this is a temporary evacuation, like everybody has to go to spaceships or another planet for a year, but then they get to come back. Well, if that was the situation, then no, the church wouldn't reassign new dioceses or things like that. Um, On the other hand, if it's a permanent relocation, so let's say everybody has to leave and go to Mars, let's say, uh, then the church uh, presumably would accommodate the new situation by assigning new dioceses for the bishops. Uh, You might be the bishop for example, of Olympus Mons, or actually Olympus Mons is so huge that uh, that uh, if you transported the entire population of Earth to Mars, there'd probably be multiple dioceses on Olympus Mons because it's like the size of France. It's the Uh, largest mountain in our solar system, I believe. Yeah, it's a it's a it's a volcano on Mars. I think it's like a sixth of the Martian surface. So it's really huge. Um, In any event, yeah, they would create new dioceses for the bishops and that would include the Bishop of Rome. But that doesn't mean that they wouldn't also retain their original diocese, because one of the customs the church has is uh, what's known as a titular diocese. A titular diocese is a place where 
usually, I mean, historically there was a diocese there, but it's no longer active because let's say it's in the part of the world that was conquered by Muslims. And so there are, there effectively aren't Christians in that city anymore, or at least enough to have a diocese. And so bishops actually typically have a titular diocese in addition to the one that, uh, that they are in active pastoral governance of. And this is also used for cardinals in Rome, even if you're a cardinal, let's say you're the head of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. So you don't have a, uh, a regular diocese that you have pastoral care of. Nevertheless, you're going to have a titular diocese somewhere. And so one of the things that would be possible in this situation is even if you're the titular, uh, even if you're the, the Bishop of Olympus Mons, let's say, uh, you might ha also be the titular diocese, the Bishop of a titular diocese back on Earth when Earth was still habitable. So maybe even the one that you originally were from. So, for example, if you're the Bishop of Baltimore and you have to relocate to become the Bishop of Olympus Mons, you might also still be titularly the Bishop of Baltimore back on Earth. And that could apply to the Pope as well. Uh, even if the Pope is, uh, let's say, now the Bishop of Syria Plenum on Mars, where there's a nice Sycor base, um, he might still be the titular bishop of Rome, as well as being the bishop of Syria Plenum. On the other hand, there's also historical precedent for the Pope living away from Rome for a long period of time. That was the case in what's known as the Avignon Papacy, where for a long period of time, even though the popes were the bishops of Rome, they were living in Avignon, France. And so it could be possible that, uh, especially if there was hope of recolonizing Earth, that the Pope might still be formally the Bishop of Rome, even if he was living in Syria Plenum, uh, but it, he wouldn't be redeclared the Bishop of Syria Plenum. He'd still be the Bishop of Rome in exile, just like the Avignon popes were in Avignon, even though they formerly had pastoral care of Rome, and they might be hoping to recolonize and resume residence in Rome. Uh, Frank, uh, thanks for the question. I hope that that was helpful uh, to you. I hope we do not have to leave Earth. I do not believe we have the, the we don't have the ships for it right now. I think there's, we're, there's not many of us getting off if we got to get off soon. Well, Elon Musk has plans for rapid ship production. Get going, Elon. Well, I don't know. I don't want to leave. I like it here. Uh, Maria uh, asks this, and it doesn't say how this came from Maria, but uh, some some way via the Internet. Uh, is the dog that saved St. Rocco from starving by bringing him bread in heaven? Could that dog have been an angel? Well, uh, it's not impossible. We talked about it on a previous um episode of Weird Questions, how angels can assume various forms. Uh, they don't have a native physical form. And historically, if you go back and you read theologians from several hundred years ago, they'll talk about angels having aerial bodies that are temporarily composed uh, and then that then dissipate when the angel's done with using that form. And uh, there's no reason that an angel has to assume a human form. In fact, in scripture, we see angels that have hybrid forms that incorporate both human elements and uh, animal elements. This is the case, for example, with um, uh, Isaiah's seraphim, who in addition to having a human form also have six wings. It's also the case even more clearly with Ezekiel's cherubim, who uh, in addition to having a human form partially, they also have wings and they'll have like the head of a lion or an eagle or an ox which is where we get the symbolism for the four Gospels. It's based on Ezekiel's uh, cherubim. And so uh, there's no reason in principle why an angel couldn't go full animal in the form that it adopts. And so I can't rule out that the possibility of St. Rocco being ministered to by an angel in the form of a dog. However, I don't think it's particularly likely because, uh, number one, the uh, the historical information we have about St. Rocco isn't 
all that reliable. Uh, he's discussed in the Golden Legend. In fact, it's even unclear w- what century he lived in. Traditionally, he was placed in the 13th century, but there's also evidence that he lived in the 14th century. If you uh, if you do some research about him. What we do have, whether it's accurate or whether it's simply legend, the dog is actually identified as having belonged to a nobleman named Gothard Palestrelli. And so uh, unless Gothard Palestrelli had an angel regularly appearing as a dog in his kennels, I would assume it was a normal dog that was owned by this nobleman. All righty. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that uh, question, uh, Maria. Uh, and up next is an email from Tom. Uh, he says, if a priest were to offer mass on the International Space Station, would the only one to be able to grant faculties for him to preach, hear confessions or witness marriages be the Pope, since he is constantly traveling, traveling over different dioceses at any given time. The more important question is whether a mass in space with microgravity could either even be offered validly. Would the wine be able to stay in a chalice in a valid manner? So we'll take the two questions independently. Uh, The first question about faculties, that's something that... um, It would not require the Pope's intervention. Uh, The priest would be... at at least at this point in history, from somewhere on earth, and he would be incarnated in a particular diocese, let's say the diocese of Fort Lauderdale or somewhere like that. And then he he goes up into space and it's ambiguous whether he would even be classified as being in a diocese at that point. However, one of the things that happens when priests travel is they have a document uh, that they take with them known as a celebrat, which is a which is Latin for he celebrates, meaning he celebrates the mass. And under ordinary circumstances, that celebrate gives them permission to say mass wherever they are. And similarly, it's presumed that they're able to hear confessions and things like that under ordinary circumstances, unless there's some kind of restriction placed on them, like the local bishop of wherever they are says, no, I don't want this guy hearing confessions here. So um, the ordinary Uh, faculties that the priest would have in his home diocese would transfer when he travels unless there was something stopping that from happening. And thus he'd be able to spiritually minister to people on the International Space Station. So he wouldn't need special authorization from the Pope to do that. The authorization he had from his home bishop where he's incarnated would be sufficient. In terms of the second question about the celebration of mass in microgravity, um, Tom asks, would it be valid? And the and the answer is that masses themselves are not valid or invalid. Masses are either licit, meaning they're celebrated in conformity with the law, or they're illicit, meaning they're not celebrated in conformity with the law. What's valid or invalid is the consecration of the Eucharist within the Mass. And the presence of microgravity would not affect the form or matter of the Eucharist or the intent of the priest in any substantial way. So the consecration of the Eucharist itself, if done in a microgravity environment, would be perfectly valid. That doesn't mean, though, that the Mass would be licit. Because in a microgravity environment with an ordinary chalice, the uh, precious blood would go floating out. And that would be clearly, even though it's, it's not specifically uh, stated in liturgical law that the precious blood is not to be allowed to go floating out of a chalice, um, it's implied by the requirements of taking care to avoid spills. And even though it's not like a spill in a in a normal gravitational environment, it's effectively a spill. And so you wouldn't be able to celebrate in microgravity um, with an ordinary chalice because of the danger of spillage. Now, would there be any options w- that would make this possible to be licit? Well, obviously, if we developed artificial gravity like they have in Star Trek, um, then it would be entirely possible because the artificial gravity would keep the precious blood in the chalice. 
also, if if even if we don't have artificial gravity, we could have a space station or spaceship with rotational gravity. This is uh, what happens when you spin an object in space. It creates uh, a force along the walls that imitates gravity. It's like those uh, rides they have in amusement parks where you stand up against the wall of a big barrel and they spin it real fast and it presses you against the wall. The same thing can happen uh, in spaceships and space stations. So you'll see that, for example, in um, the space station at the beginning of 2001, A Space Odyssey, that has rotational gravity. Also on various spaceships, in the series Babylon 5, they have rotational gravity, and that's well within our ability to do. We could actually build spaceships or space stations that have that kind of gravity, and then you could use an ordinary chalice to celebrate mass licitly in orbit. But that's not microgravity. So what about microgravity? Are there ways to deal with that? And I think the answer is yes, but you'd need an enclosed chalice, something that is um, d does not permit the precious blood to just float everywhere. Uh, that could be a single object that's shaped in such a way that uh, it will hold the uh, precious blood in, or it could be a chalice that you've retrofitted with an additional um, appliance on top of it to keep the precious blood from floating around. And you might need slight modifications <clears throat> of liturgical law to accommodate such a vessel, but it would be in principle possible. Uh, thank you very much for those questions, Tom. It looks like we're going space dog space today because now we got a question with a dog in it. Stephen wants to know, Jimmy, why is St. Christopher shown with a dog's head? The reason is, as far as I've been able to determine, because according to many accounts, St. Christopher was a Canaanite or a Canaanian. And the word for, well, I, I guess I should back up and say, if you go you go back and you look at legends, there are legends about people with dog's heads or other canine characteristics. In fact, I just did an episode of Mysterious World on werewolves and talked about the uh, uh, some of the legends going back into antiquity, like Greek authors, for example, will talk about um, people who transform into wolves and, and so forth. But there were also legends about people who like had a dog's head or similar characteristics, and they were typically thought to live on the edge of the world, like maybe they had some contact with normal humans, but not a lot. And so there were kind of traveler's tales and legends about people oh. who lived in very distant places. And so then you have stories about St. Christopher being a Canaanian or Canaanite. And um, that word sounds a lot like Canaanian, sounds a lot like Canis the Latin word for a dog. Yeah. Uh, a typical dog is a Canis familiaris, a household dog or family dog. And so it appears that this, um, his reported national identity as Canaan, a Canaanite or Canaanian led to some people thinking of him as if he was one of these dog headed people because it sounded like the <laughs> word in Latin for dog. Oh, poor St. Christopher. Um, uh, well, uh, thanks, Stephen, for that question. Jimmy, uh, this is a time travel uh, question. So mm -hmm. it require it's, you know, it require. I'll, I'll read it to you. Uh, it requ okay. requires a little attending to uh, to get it. But I, I ever since you came back from the future, I've noticed you have no problem uh, with these time travel questions. So uh, let's say your adult son from the future travels to the present day. And informs you that he was, one, conceived out of wedlock. And two, was raised by his single mother because you married another woman. And three, all of that set him on a path to becoming Pope. Here's the question. How obligated would you be to ensuring that timeline remain intact, intact since any slight alteration could result in your son not being born? Not obligated at all. 
Uh, you would not be obligated at all to ensure that that timeline occurs. Um, you will sometimes in some science fiction find people who are operating with what's sometimes called a temporal prime directive, where they want to preserve the flow of history. You'll find that, for example, in Star Trek, in various iterations of Star Trek. They'll have people who are time travelers that are honoring a temporal prime directive and they're not allowed to change history. Well, I understand if you are a time traveler going into the past, you want to be able to get back to your own time. And so you have an interest in preserving the timeline that led up to your situation. I mean, you wouldn't want to go back into the past and come back and find that nobody is who you remember, that you're not married, your kids don't exist, and none of your friends exist, and you know, whatever else has happened differently. So you, as someone going into the past, would have a self-interested reason to preserve the timeline. But if you're living in the past and a future, and this is all assuming it's possible for time to be rewritten. Um, but if someone comes to you from the future and says, this is what happened in the future and you need to let that happen, um, that's something that you'd have to make a prudential judgment call about. But there's no obligation on us today to use our free will in such a way that it we're obliged morally to ensure a particular future comes to pass. Instead, what we're obliged to do is use our free will in such a way that we behave morally so that we do our best to ensure a moral timeline comes about. And if someone comes to me and says, hi, I'm the future pope, I'm your son, I was conceived out of wedlock, I would say, well, sorry, I'm going to do my best to avoid that timeline from happening because I'm it's not moral for me to conceive a child out of wedlock. And so I understand this is in your interest to have this timeline, and maybe you'll be able to get back to that timeline, but I am not allowed to uh, to uh, conceive a child out of wedlock, and so I'm simply not going to do that. And furthermore, if you're the Pope, you ought to know better because you're creating a stumbling <laughs> block for me by trying to tempt me into doing something that's immoral, and you as a Pope should know better. Shame on you. Go see your confessor. I am tired of these time-traveling Popes coming back and telling people to commit sins. I am, I am yeah. against it. Uh, all right. Thanks very much. For, I, I might have got carried away there. Um, thanks very much. Uh, that was Ryan, right? Uh, yeah, Ryan. Thank you for that question. Yep. Uh, this one's from Pat. Uh, could we, or at least the people responsible for it, allow artificial intelligence to call us or consider us their creator gods? In a sense, artificial intelligence would be created ex nihilo and would be imprinted with our humanity without being human. So is it OK for the AI to worship us? So artificial intelligence, it wouldn't be created ex nihilo because we would be making it out of stuff. You know, there has to be a substrate uh, of, you know, in computer technology for an AI to reside in and then you have to program it. So it wouldn't be ex nihilo. Um, there certainly might be AI creators who have the egotism needed to program their AIs to worship them, but uh, it wouldn't be moral to do so because uh, what we need to do is have a sense of proportion in the honor that we give to people. Um, and only God is all good. Only God is infinitely good. And so we should only give the true God true worship in the sense of recognizing his omni goodness, his his infinite goodness. And since we're not infinitely good, it would be reasonable for artificial intelligence to recognize the good qualities we do have. That's just being realistic. But it would not be uh, reasonable for artificial intelligence to regard us as if we were all good or infinitely good the way that God is. So it would be immoral and contrary to reality, to program AI to worship us by giving us divine worship. Uh, obviously, it could give us respect for what we've done, but not beyond that. Also, uh, just personally, I don't think AIs will ever have consciousness. They'll just behave as if they do. So I don't think uh, it's any different than, you know, 
I, I don't think programming an AI to treat you with respect is any different than programming your Alexa to treat you with respect. Can I just get it to do the dishes and the laundry? That's all I want. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If, why not? If we can get AI to do that, then I am I'm fine with the rest. I just want it separating the lights from the darks and fold it when it comes out. It's not there yet, Jimmy. The technology is not where I want it to be yet. The, the well, it's kind of there. It's getting there. Let's see. I want the thing to come in to my room, pick it up off the floor. <laughs> so, so my wife will think I did it and take it to the laundry, wash it, fold it. I, that, that's what I'm looking for. I'm not just, you looking. want, Ro- you want Rosie, the robot from the Jetsons. I, well, you, I mean, come on, come on. Rosie can do it all. She can cook. She can walk the dog. Um, uh, it's it's weird questions with Jimmy Aiken, and uh, we got a whole bunch of weird questions, uh, and so I'm going to go ahead right back to them. Um, okay, so we are the AI should not worship us; it should fold our clothes, which is not worth of us. Adam says this: uh, If technology ever develops Star Trek level matter teleportation, and that t- technology was used to transport people, would the transported person be the exact same upon re? rematerialization down to the God-given soul, or would they just be a near perfect facsimile with a different soul, given that the person is essentially destroyed at the molecular level when transported? If the latter, would the transporter operator be in any way culpable for the death of the person who was dematerialized, be that person human, Klingon, or even Android? So Star Trek plays it fast and loose with how uh, teleporters work on the show, with how transporters work. In a lot of places, Star Trek implies that you are torn apart and human consciousness does not persist through the transportation process, in which case it looks like it really does kill you. In other passages in Star Trek, though, it is implied that your consciousness persists throughout the transport process, in which case it would look like this is some kind of transition, but not an actual destruction. And that's just Star Trek. There are other methods of teleportation that are non-destructive. But if we're talking about a destructive form of teleportation, then um, upon being rematerialized, presumptively, it would be a different person with a different soul. Uh, It would be just like the situation of twinning, where you have initially, uh, you have uh, one body as a twin before the twinning process occurs, and it has one soul. Then when the twin fissions, you have two bodies, each of which has its own soul. This would be something similar, where you tear apart one body, and then you make a new body. Since you got a new living body, it's got a new living soul. Uh, Consequently, it wouldn't be the same person. It would have similar memories, but it wouldn't really be you. In terms of the transporter operator, yes, if uh, that person... uh, dematerializes somebody who has a a rational soul like a human or a Klingon, then they would be guilty of murder. On the other hand, if they just uh, dematerialize an android like Mr. Data, sorry, he's a toaster. All he's done is disassemble a toaster, not murder. Did you just call Data a toaster? Yeah. Oh, man. He may be a skin job, but he's a toaster. (laughs) All right. Jimmy. Uh, All right. We're going to Brandon now. Before I start arguing about whether or not data is a toaster, I'll just let Brandon ask you his question. Brandon says, if God exists outside of time and space as we know it here and now, it's not an if, Brandon. uh, Will his existence be different in heaven for eternity after the final judgment? We can only assume heaven, too, will exist in time and space since we will have our glorified bodies. Or will it? That's a lot of stuff Uh, there. Yeah, so um, there is a difference. Uh, We have to make a couple of careful distinctions here. The first one is about eternity. Uh, There are two types of eternity. There's the type that God experiences in his essence, and that is true timelessness. So God in his divine essence is outside of space and time. The other type of eternity is the one that we experience, which is everlastingness. You actually have time or something analogous to time, uh, 
but it does go on forever and ever. And that's true of all created beings, humans and angels. If you're a created being, you don't experience true timelessness. You experience, you may experience everlastingness, but you don't experience true timelessness. That then means we need to also distinguish uh, two senses of how we use the word heaven. If by heaven you mean where God is in his essence, in his divine essence, then heaven is uh, something that only God experiences. But the way we normally use heaven is to refer to the state of communion that we have together with God spiritually. And since we will have glorified bodies that need to exist somewhere in some medium that's at least analogous to the way we experience space and time, then... um, Uh, It will have dimensionality. It will have an everlasting form of eternity, but not a timeless form of eternity. So what does that mean for God's experience of eternity after the final judgment? Well, as I often illustrate, God's experience, God experiences all of time all at once. And so it's kind of like what we experience if we stand back and look at a mural. A murals, you know, are big paintings. Frequently they're made on walls, and oftentimes a mural will have a, a story that it tells. And at one end of the mural, you'll see the beginning of the story. In the middle of the mural, you'll see the middle of the story. At the far end of the mural, you'll see the end of the story. And it's, in essence, that's the way God experiences time. He sees all of it at once, including the unlimited, endless future. So God himself won't have any change occur for him after the final judgment. He's outside of time seeing all of history and interacting with all of history all at once. He'll just continue continue his interactions with history after the point of the final judgment, but it won't be any different for him. All right. Okay. I think I got that. Uh, Thank you, Brandon, uh, for that question. It's weird uh, questions with Jimmy Aiken and Len uh, asks this. If an animal here on Earth evolved to be clearly rational in the same way humans are, would they need to be baptized? Would they be considered made in the image and likeness of God as well? And would they have equal, greater, lesser intrinsic worth, worth, excuse me, than us? Uh, And then uh, Len writes, same goes for aliens. Okay, so for aliens, I'm going to refer you to episode 55 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, which is all about the theological implications that would follow if we discovered intelligent aliens. As far as creatures here on Earth... um, So the first question was, if they evolve to be clearly rational the same way humans are, would they need to be baptized? Not necessarily. Not if they were unfallen. Uh, Because if you're unfallen, you don't need to be baptized to be redeemed. You don't need to be redeemed. On the other hand, it might still be possible for them to be baptized, not because they need redemption, but just to become part of the body of Christ. Would they be uh, considered made in the image and likeness of God? That depends on how you understand the image and likeness of God. That that can be understood in more than one way. One of the things that you uh, find when you study how this concept is used in theology is that it's not simply equated with intelligence. Uh, In 2004, I want to say, the International Theological Commission, which is a a group that does work advising the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith in Rome, they published a uh, document called Communion and Stewardship, which dealt with uh, the image and likeness of God in man. And one of the things that a point that they made is it's not simply reducible to our rationality. It also has to do with the fact that we were commissioned by God to rule the earth in his stead. And thus we're God's representative creature among earthly creatures. So the question for this understanding of the image and likeness of God would depend on the extent to which the new intelligent animal uh, 
would have what what's its role to what extent is it serving as god's ruling representative on earth alongside us to the extent it does serve in that capacity it would share the image and likeness of god to the extent it doesn't it wouldn't I mean, you can't imagine an intelligent creature that's as smart as us, but has no interest in governing Earth on behalf of God. Um, It just wants to, you know, play with toys or something, Um, you know, like octopi sometimes do. On the other hand, uh, you can also conceptualize the image and likeness of God in other ways to such that any degree of similarity a creature has to God to that extent, it rep- it has the image or likeness of God. If it if it's like God in this way, well, then to that extent, it has the likeness of God. And based on that broader understanding or more flexible understanding, every creature has one or another degree of likeness or similarity to God. The angels have it. We have it. Other creatures here on Earth have it uh, because every created reality has some uh, manifestation of God's greatness to it, and thus some degree of likeness to God. In terms of would they have equal, greater, or lesser intrinsic worth, that's a uh, harder question to answer, but the presumption would be that the, the safe presumption, the one that we need to certainly start with, is anything as smart as us needs to be treated as if it has the same rights as we do. So we would want to treat these creatures as if they have the same worth that we do. Thank you uh, very much for the question, Len. It is Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken. Uh, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, we got two baptism questions in a row. They are both weird, but I'm going to say right now, by way of a tease, one of them is probably my favorite baptism question we have ever gotten on Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken. So we'll get to that. When we come back. You know which one I'm talking about, Jimmy, do you? I know which one you're yeah. talking about. Right. Oh, yeah. The force is strong with me. <laughs> uh, Michelle has a question for Jimmy uh, during Weird Questions with Jimmy Aiken. This is one of our two uh, baptism questions. Michelle's question is not uh, the weirdest baptism question I've ever seen, uh, but it's a good one. Can Baby Yoda receive baptism? Uh, if Baby Yoda asks for it, then yes, you could baptize Baby Yoda at least conditionally. The more interesting question would be, could Baby Yoda's guardian, I guess the Mandalorian, request baptism on his behalf? And I think the, even though it's a little less certain, I think the presumptive answer is going to be yes, uh, because if Baby Yoda asked for himself, um, it would be possible, and Baby Yoda. It, now we don't know if aliens can receive baptism validly, but the Church would err on the side of caution and assume that if a creature asks for baptism, understanding what it is, that uh, it's capable of receiving baptism, at, and so there would be a conditional baptism mm-hmm. of of any alien life form that requested it. This is, again, something I go into in episode 55 of Mysterious World. Um, now, the church also recognizes that baptism can be requested on behalf of a rational life form that is not yet old enough to make a decision on its own, could be requested by the guardian that, which is uh, that life form, which is why parents can request baptism for their children. So knowing that Baby Yoda belongs to a rational species, uh, it would be possible in theory for Baby Yoda's guardian to ask on his behalf. Uh, It's, like I said, less certain since we don't know for the even for a fact that aliens could receive baptism validly. But again, the precautionary principle would apply. And especially if Baby Yoda was in danger of death, Mm -hmm. the Mandalorian would be able to request baptism on his behalf. And I'm sure it would be administered at least conditionally, meaning you administer with it with a formula like if you are capable of being baptized, I baptize you. OK, but so but in normal, let's say there's no fear of death because I got to follow the logic of Michelle's question here. Mm-hmm. Uh, the Mandalorian would appear to be the guardian of baby Yoda. Does the mm-hmm. ma- w- does the Mandalorian need to be baptized uh, in order to request no. that? No, no. 
No, you don't have to be baptized. All that is required for baptism is the uh, consent of at least one of the child's parents or guardians and a founded hope that the child will be raised Catholic. Oh, all right. All right. I think the Mandalorian should, but um, he doesn't have to. Okay. Uh, Eric's question is next. Eric has a very pleasantly weird mind. Uh, Eric asks... If you baptize the Wicked Witch of the West with water, is that an act of charity or an act of murder? <laughs> it's going to depend on the situation. Uh, obviously, uh, if the Wicked Witch of the West does not consent to the baptism, it's straight out murder. Yeah. On right. the other hand, um, this would be a situation where it's going to depend on the circumstances. Uh, under ordinary circumstances, if you have the Wicked Witch of the West who is in the prime of health, you know, she's she's not uh, about to die or anything like that. Um, I would say that the fact she is biologically incapable of tolerating water so that she'll die uh, would be reason to delay baptism. Uh, this was something that happened in the early church sometimes. People would delay baptism until they were in danger of death. And since this would cause her to die, I would say, assuming you can't just do like a little drop or that even a little drop will kill her, um, but assuming that any amount of water will cause her to die or any amount that you would need to be able to perform baptism, even a few drops would cause her to die, then it would warrant her repenting of her beautiful wickedness, but then at <laughs> least waiting till she's in danger of death before she's baptized. Now, when you get to a situation where she's going to die anyway, then the moral uh, analysis of the act changes because she's going to die anyway. And by baptizing her, you give a greater certainty of her salvation. And in that case, the law of double effect would apply. You foresee her death by water, but you're not killing her. It's not uh, deliberately. It's not an end in itself. Neither is killing her the means to another end. If she were somehow to survive water baptism, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but it would at least in this situation, if she's about to die anyway, it would at least be arguable that the law of double effect would apply and that her death would be a foreseen consequence that is neither intended as an end or as a means. Uh, all right. Um, OK, she she does have to repent of her beautiful wickedness, however. I, she does. I, that's, yeah. that's no joke. You got to repent. Um, yeah. If you think your wickedness is beautiful, I'm going to give you a, a little mid show review. I don't usually do mid show reviews, Jimmy, but Jennifer on Facebook okay. has given you a review. She says, I totally hate science fiction, but this is a bit entertaining. Good. I, like, I like that. She said a bit. <laughs> it's a, yeah. This is a bit entertaining. All right. Next weird Good. question for Jimmy Aiken. Uh, Jimmy, this is from Maria. I have heard heaven described as a banquet feast. If this is true, then my quest is who? No, my question, excuse me, is who will be at our table? My son was adopted. Will he be with my husband and I or his birth mother? Thanks. For some reason, it saddens me that he might not be with us in this scenario. I think for some I think the reason might be obvious, but. Well, um, so there are several things to say here. The first one is it's true that Scripture does use the imagery of a great feast for heaven. Um, but when Scripture uses imagery to describe the, the afterlife and the next age, it's because we're not capable in the present age of being able to fathom what it's like. Our imaginations are limited by our experiences. That's why if you watch science fiction, the, angel, the a aliens almost always look like combinations of things we have here on Earth. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's, oh, it's a human, but it's got pointy ears or something. Right. Um, well, uh because our imaginations are limited by our experiences, we have no experience of the afterlife. And that means that we that scripture uses 
imagery that is to a significant extent symbolic to convey these greater realities. And to a person in the ancient world, a feast was a great thing. Most people lived hand to mouth uh, and didn't have a lot of food, especially not lavish, really tasty food all the time. And so a feast was a great thing. Uh, and so scripture uses that image to convey to us that it's going to be really great. It's going to be like a feast, but that doesn't mean we should take the imagery overly literally. Now, there may or may not be something corresponding to a feast in heaven in the more literal sense, but uh, either way, I don't think we need to worry about this because, as John says at the end of Revelation, there's not going to be any more crying or sadness or tears or pain for the old order of things will have passed away. And that means that we're not going to be unhappy there. And so we'll have everything we need to be happy. And if if uh, I would I would suppose a strong and strongly uh suppose that we're going to have access to everybody we cared about on earth. And so you'll have access to your adopted son. And I I firmly expect that. And you will consequently be happy. But uh, to kind of give a bottom line answer, since we'll have everything we'll need to be happy to the extent you need contact with your adopted son, you'll have that. So don't worry about it. Don't worry. Be happy. <laughs> you did it. Now I have a song stuck in my head that, well, I guess you saved me from that other one. Uh, Keith, Keith, come on with this question. All right. I'm going to ask it. Jimmy, okay. do you think Oswald was the lone gunman? I don't know for sure. Um, Oswald may not have been a gunman at all. I've done a lot of research on the JFK assassination, and I have a settled opinion. And by the way, there's an episode of Mysterious World on this, but I don't have a settled opinion about who actually killed JFK. I understand the arguments for Oswald being a lone gunman, but there there are enough counter arguments. I think it's also possible Oswald was not a lone gunman, that he had help. And I think it's possible that Oswald was exactly what he said he was, a patsy, that he wasn't involved in pulling the trigger at all and that it was other people. So I think that uh, there's enough evidence for more than one position we need to proceed carefully and not just assume anything in this case. And in fact, uh, we've had two different official investigations of the JFK assassination. The first was the Warren Commission in the 1960s, and it concluded that Oswald acted alone. The second was the House uh, Assassinations uh, Committee investigation in the 1970s, and it concluded Oswald did not act alone. And then so we have from two different government investigations, we have conflicting results. Um, And I think there's also a, a significant possibility of a third option, which is Oswald was what he said, a patsy. Um, that's the that's the most extensive use of the word patsy we have ever had on this program. Uh, th- uh, thanks, Keith, for the question. Molly wants to know this, Jimmy. I really want to know what's up with the giants in the Bible. Yeah, so um, there are various passages that talk about giants, and uh, these are also linked to the Nephilim of the Bible. In fact, there are the word Nephilim may be based on the Aramaic word for giant. And in fact, that's the way the Septuagint Greek Old Testament translates the word Nephilim. It translates it as gigantes, which is the word for giant in Greek or giants in Greek. Um, If you want to learn about the Nephilim, check out Mysterious World. I've got an episode on that. But I'm also going to be doing more on giants in general in the Bible. And from uh, what I can tell, based on my study of the text, the Bible does indeed talk about people that were larger than normal, at least larger than the ancient Hebrews. In the ancient world, like we mentioned, people didn't have a lot of food, they didn't have great nutrition, and they didn't grow as tall as uh, people do now. They there were larger than normal people, but that doesn't mean they were 12 or 15 feet tall. We'd like to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including Gary H., Mike K., Hector M., Matthew R., and Jesse J., 
Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows of StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V.com, making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. And by RosaryArmy.com. Have more peace. Visit RosaryArmy.com and get a free all-twine knotted rosary, downloadable audio rosaries, and more. Make them, pray them, give them away at rosaryarmy.com. All right, those are some great questions and answers. You can send us your feedback by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, sending us an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, or sending a tweet to at mys underscore world with the hashtag of mysterious feedback. Until next time, Jimmy Akin, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Tom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World on StarQuest. <laughs>